Welcome everyone to our April lecture on solar eclipse, the Anima problem in Patrick Roth's book, Skylight, Starlight Terrace. And a warm welcome to our guest speakers today, author, director, and screenwriter, Patrick Roth of Southern California, and Dr. Michaela Kopp Marx, professor of modern German literature at the University of Heidelberg. We're delighted to have you with us today. In his book, Starlight Terrace, we're acquainted with four Hollywood residents in or beyond midlife whose thoughts, feelings, and actions are influenced by the movies and by archetypal patterns in their lives. First, Patrick Roth will read his second story in the book called Solar Eclipse which focuses on the hero Moth or Moses, who confronts his anima and finds relationship with his feminine side. Then in parts two and three of the program, Dr. Kopp Marx will discuss themes and motifs in this individuation story and interpret them from a depth psychological perspective. Patrick Roth is a German-American who moved to the United States in his early 20s, where he began his artistic career as director and screenwriter in Los Angeles. In the early 1990s, he switched to prose and is best known as a writer of biblical archetypal narratives rendered in a cinematic style, such as in his well-received work, De Christus Trilogie, the Christ Trilogy. Since 2007, he has been a resident scholar of the C.G. Young Study Center of Southern California and is currently a member of their board of directors. Michaela Kopp Marx is a specialist in modern and contemporary literature, especially relating to visual art, film, and uh, fiction. She is interested in the analytic psychology of C.G. Jung and in the use of archetypes and symbols in literature, as in the works of Patrick Roth. She published and annotated a new edition of De Christus Trilogy in 2017. Michaela is training as a union psychotherapist at the Research and Training Center for Depth Psychology in Zurich and conducts control case analyses. So without further ado, let's begin with Patrick Roth reading of solar eclipse with focus on the anima problem. Patrick, you're on. Okay, I, I just unmuted myself. Did you, can you hear me all? Yes, we hear you. Okay, perfect. Let me <clears throat> get situated here. Get my reading glasses. Let me first of all thank Virginia and and Judy for for uh, for introducing us, for inviting us, and uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Holly Fincher who made the original connection between us and the uh, the Orange County. Uh, club. I've seen a few people here that I recognize and my heart just goes out to them because they're old friends. And uh, some of them actually live or used to live in the neighborhood that uh, this stories, uh, the, these stories, the Starlight Terrace stories take place. Um, you will hear that Starlight Terrace is an actual apartment building on Dickens Street in Sherman Oaks and um, still exists today. Uh, I used to live just a couple of houses further left, that is toward the east, so that I have to say that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the apartment complex in my stories, uh, these four stories, is an amalgam basically of both the Deauville where I used to live and the, uh, the Starlight Terrace uh, a couple of doors down on, on Dickens. Okay, now can you, do you see me uh, uh, in a, as a large picture? Because I don't, 
Yes. Okay, now you, I double click you, on. You, if you go up to the view and click on. I got it. I just got it. View, right. Speaker okay. view. Okay. Perfect. Swig of water. I would like to dedicate this reading to two of the most important Americans I've met in my life that were extremely influential. I'm dedicating it to Diane Cordick and to Edward F. Edinger. Solar eclipse. Moss McLeod was expecting a visit from his daughter that all the residents of Starlight Terrace knew. But she doesn't exist, Pete told me when he ran into me on the steps of our apartment complex. It was the last weekend in December, and at this hour of the morning it was still dark. Pete was on his way to Noah's, and I had been looking up and down Dickens Street for any sign of a woman who had supposedly just left the building. From time to time, McLeod invents this daughter, Pete muttered as he stepped onto the dew-drenched grass and stomped towards the pink, weather-beaten Starlight Terrace sign. It was only recently that I had met Moss, who occupied the small apartment next to the laundry room, a stage actor who had gone on to work for a Broadway casting agency. Moss had uh, left New York years ago and moved to Los Angeles. We knew each other only by sight when one morning he approached me out of the blue at Noah's and told me he had run into Jack Palance the day before at Borders, and Jack had remembered him. In the old days, when they were both performing in Darkness at Noon, the play based on Kessler's novel, Palance had tormented him, grilling him without mercy. But yesterday, at the bookstore, Palance had been remarkably friendly. A changed man, Moss asserted, pulling an old black and white photo out of his wallet. It showed Jack Palance bending menacingly over a pale young man who had tripped on the stage and was gazing dramatically into the camera. How long ago was that? I must have asked Moss, because as I recall, he paused only a moment to think and then replied, I can tell you exactly. That photo was taken on the evening of November 22nd 1963. We debated whether we should go on at all. That was the day Kennedy was killed. On this particular morning, Moss had rung my bell early, perhaps because he saw a light in my apartment. He stared at me in helpless confusion, as if he had just awakened from a terrible dream. His daughter had knocked on his door, he said, and since the light switch by his bed did not work, he had fumbled around and failed to get to the door in time. No doubt she thought her daddy was still asleep, and now she's already on the way back to her car, Moss speculated. He asked whether I would mind taking a quick look outside. His legs were giving him trouble these days. He invents this daughter to make himself feel better, Pete commented as he shoved the small one-bedroom apartment for rent plaque that was sliding out of its holder back into the middle of the Starlight Terrace sign. Rex's old apartment was still vacant. Do you ever see Moss at Noah's? I asked. Yeah, he never gets there as early as I do. And if he does, he sits off in a corner pretending to be engrossed in his manuscript. He goes to Noah's only because he's homesick for New York. He never talked to Rex and me. Jew, he seems to trust. By the way, I told him you were also a writer. I was hoping he'd tell you what he's working on. That I'd be interested to hear. Pete grinned and headed off to Noah's, his hands stuffed into his jacket pockets. 
his breath formed a white cloud in the darkness as he passed through the glow of a streetlight. I went back into the complex and was just passing the pool in the inner courtyard when the automatic timer switched off the underwater illumination and the turquoise blue disappeared. On the far side of the pool, back where Moss's apartment was, I could see light. His door was still open. So he's waiting for me, I thought. He thinks I'm coming back with his daughter. I headed for his door, calling out to him, but there was no answer. As I stepped inside, I saw on the sagging couch to the right of the door, a cardboard container of melted chocolate ice cream and a bag of Christmas cookies. The television was on and the screen showed the profile of some retired CIA agent talking on Fox News about Islamic terrorism. I found myself remembering Pete's comment that Moss's principal form of nourishment was Dreyer's chocolate ice cream. Inside the apartment, a musty smell wafted towards me, and it was clear that no one had done any cleaning in years. The floor and every available surface were covered with yellowing manuscripts, legal documents, letters, and magazines. The piles of paper tipping or toppled over left Moss little room to move around. I called his name again. Meanwhile, a line in a handwritten letter poking out from a stack of magazines caught my eye. In blue ink, the line read, for God's sake, don't give up on me, Moss. An insect of some kind was crawling up the side of the paper. I'm over here, I heard Moss say. He was kneeling at the entrance to the kitchenette by the counter. Were you able to catch up with her? No, there was no one outside the building when I got there. Only Pete on his way to Noah's. You're sure? What am I going to do now? On the dark floor of the small kitchen, I could make out hundreds of pages of manuscript scattered in all directions. Moss picked up one of them, then replaced it carefully. Good God. I must have bumped into the table when I was running to open the door for Amy. Knocked over the whole manuscript. My manuscript. How will I ever get these pages in order again? It was his life story, Moss explained. He had written it down for Amy to let her know, as he was determined she should one day, that her father had sacrificed everything for her, everything. That would put an end once and for all to the lies her mother had told about him, lies with which she had turned Amy against her father and poisoned their relationship. Pete's got it wrong, I thought. This daughter does exist, though it was unlikely she had knocked on Moss's door just now. Do you have a picture of her, of Amy? He braced himself against the wall and struggled to his feet, holding onto the door jam. I know, Moss said. Pete claims I just imagine her. It may be true that I, that a few times I dreamed I heard the doorbell and Amy was standing outside. That's possible, but, but there are signs and portents for everything. Everything, buddy. Moss looked at me as though he were testing me watching to see his words effect. So, he hesitated, can I trust you? What do you mean, I asked. You won't rat me out when they come. As he gazed at me, I saw he was trembling. Pete had mentioned that Moss was terrified of being taken to a nursing home. His stepsister, who lived in Gainesville, Florida, and supported Moss financially, might insist on his being moved to a home out of concern for his health. You mean the people who come to take you to a nursing home? Don't worry, Moss. Moss went to the door and closed it. Who knows how they'll identify themselves, he said. Off to the home, they may say. Those guys will even pack a suitcase for you. And then it's off to the showers. I tell you, those are coming back. These days, 
You don't even have to read between the lines. Pete's clued in too, by the way. I, I had no choice but to tell him. But if things reach that point, just follow them in. Don't be shy. They'll search the place, but I'll happen not to be here. Tell them you expect me back in a couple of hours. Got it? I still had no idea what he was talking about. All I had done was ask whether he had a picture of his daughter. Then Moss went to the closet in the wall opposite the kitchen counter. He beckoned to me. Moss opened the closet, which was crammed with suits, ties, and shirts, shoved them aside, and stepped in. He kneeled, his back to me. For a moment, it looked as though he were meditating or praying. Then he raised one arm and groped for something on the back wall. I saw the panel yield, swinging away. Moss beckoned to me again, stepped through the opening, and disappeared. Follow me. I stepped gingerly after him. On the other side of the wall, it was dark. Wait, I heard Moss saying. I'll turn on the light. Suddenly I saw, only three or four steps in front of me, the entrance to a dimly lit bedroom. This is where you sleep? Sometimes, Moss replied. Well, more and more often these days. It's safer here in my ark of bulrushes. On the floor of the small room lay a mattress with sheets, a couple of blankets and pillows. A lamp stood next to the mattress. In one corner, I saw a radio, a stuffed backpack, a three gallon bottle of arrowhead water, some cans of peaches and a, a partially eaten chocolate bar. Don't rat me out, he repeated. Don't worry, Moss, but is there any ventilation in here? In the summer, it must be like an oven. Moss patted the wall behind the backpack. There's a vent here. In a pinch, I can even throw, crawl through. Uh, the freshest air comes in from the laundry room. And I used to hear singing, too. He made the night a little brighter. Wherever he would go, the old lamp lighter of long, long ago. Rex used to sing that, Moss said. He provided entertainment while he was folding his laundry. Moss hummed as he picked up the lamp. He held it to a framed picture hanging above the mattress at eye level. Is that Amy? Moss answered. How old is she there? Three. That was on her third birthday, he said, November 12. See how happy she is? We were still in New York then in 66. She's offering me a picture she'd just drawn for me. Moss squatted down and pointed to a colored photocopy he had tacked to the wall at the head of the mattress. I keep the original in my backpack, he said. A horse? A horse with blue wings, if you please. She'd seen it on television. Pegasus. It was meant to protect me, Moss explained proudly. I turned and pointed to a photo of a child on the opposite wall, next to the passage to the closet. Is that her as well? Moss held the lamp close to the picture. No, 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 no. That, that, that's a photo from a newspaper article. That's me, the kid with a bandaged head. But the puppy wasn't mine. I'm sorry to say, I don't know whose dachshund that was. Some, someone just placed it next to me when they were taking pictures for the paper. I'm three there, like Amy. Uh, two pictures are looking at each other. See? I tried to decipher the yellow text next to the photo. It came from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. The headline was still legible. Miracle Boy survives fall from fourth floor. So what happened? They say I fell out of the window. <laughs> That's ridiculous. I went back later to see for myself. There was no way I could have climbed onto the windowsill at three. No, 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 no. I think my mother threw me out of the window in a rage. She'd been fighting with my stepfather, a reliable source told me. I don't know my real father. 
<laughs> you laugh. He was a he was a milkman. Yes, yes, and and Jewish too. Marriage was out of the question. To avoid a scandal, they sent her to Vienna. So I was born there, though the official record says otherwise. All her life, she suffered from depression, from migraines, from uncontrollable rages. I'm telling you, she threw me out of that window. I, I landed on the sidewalk head first, dead. Dead is what the ambulance driver said when he got there. He didn't even want to put me on the stretcher, the good man. But the other paramedic insisted on loading me in the ambulance and taking me to the hospital. God only knows why. I must have looked awful. Never found out his name, the man I owe my life to. At any rate, as you see there, I, I was back on my feet in three weeks, and they sent me home with that bandage. Look, Moss pointed to his forehead. Above his shaggy right eyebrow, a thin line a bit paler than the rest of his skin ran on an angle to the base of his nose and angled up sharply. Go ahead, feel it, Moss urged me. When I put my finger on the scar, the skin gave way alarmingly. <laughs> There's no bone under there, Moss explained, laughing. That was my brain you just tickled. The fact that the doctors left it unprotected like that saved my life a number of times, or so I would say today. There were periods when I was in such despair over my situation that I wanted to volunteer for whatever war we happened to be fighting, Korea, even Cuba, Vietnam. But each time they turned me down, 4F, Moss pressed a finger into his forehead. Nothing doing. A little later, I made my way back to my apartment, saddened and shaken by what I had seen and heard. Here, feel how heavy this is, he had said when he returned to his living room and he'd picked up a random pile of manuscript and pressed it into my hands. It certainly is, I'd replied. Take it with you he'd urged me. I can't read it anymore. My eyes are giving out. Not right now, I'd said, and was relieved when he took the manuscript back. Hoping to distract myself from the image of the lonely old man living amid that chaos of papers, tormented by anxiety and filled with unjustified anticipation, I I climbed back into bed and switched on the television. Outside, the sky was turning gray. Key Largo had already started. A hurricane was approaching the southern coast of Florida. Carl Freund's cinematography captured the chalky gray light presaging a storm while Bogart helped Lauren Bacall tie up the boat at the pier. At the hotel, Edward G. Robinson was holed up with his gangsters. Robinson was Johnny Rocco, who had left his Cuban exile and had chugged to the keys in his boat to close a deal. The gangster was homesick for America. But at this point, Bogart has no idea what kind of person he's dealing with. He just met Bacall, and from the bow, he tosses the rope across the water to her. Bacall, on the pier, catches the rope and places the loop over one of the bollards. And then, then Bogart uses the same rope to pull himself over the gap, along with the boat and me, back to Bacall. What a feat to glide along, pulling and being pulled at the same time. The three or four yards over the water, back to the landing, where Bacall is waiting. Bogart climbs into her frame up the dock, and then the two of them stand there together again in a two shot. Now the storm can come. During the commercial, I dozed off. Moments before, I had been thinking about my parents and the way they met on Heidelberg's main street. 
near the corner by the grain market. Around the same time as Bacall and Bogart were filming the scene on the dock in the Warner Brothers studio. Had my father and his friend left the Red Ox only a few seconds later, had they paid their check only two or three seconds later, or alternatively, but their codes faster, a storm was gathering outside and reached the grain market corner two or three seconds earlier, I would not have been there to join the call on the pier. I dozed off. It seems to me in my dream that I've just woken up. I tried to switch on my bedside lamp, but it won't go on. The room stays dark. Everything is silent. And suddenly it becomes clear to me that something is wrong with the fuse. No power in the whole apartment. In my dream, it comes to me that Moss mentioned his light switch was broken too. I make my way towards the closed curtains, sensing that the reason everything is so quiet outside is that it may have snowed. As I stand by the curtain and am about to lift one corner and peep outside, the woman standing behind me on the right seems very familiar. She woke up with me, I realize. A pleasant feeling to have her so close. I move a bit to one side to let her see out. A very faint, high tone can be heard, hovering in the air like the ah sound, remembered from childhood visits to the theater when the curtain rises. And in fact, it looks to us at first as if the street outside is buried in snow. All this must have happened while we were sleeping, we think. Then in my dream, I realize that what I'm seeing is a raging torrent, not snow, but chalky white rainwater rushing by. Yet it isn't raining. No, it rained earlier. The rain cascaded down from the hills, is flooding at a terrific speed along the street and past our building. And then down below, by our building, on our side of the water, someone is trying to cross the street. <laughs> not possible, I think. How can he prevail against the crushing power of the water? He looks like Bogart. But then I recognize Moss. His disheveled hair and the scar on his forehead give him away. As I watch, Moss tosses a rope into the rushing stream. It wraps itself around a blue fender floating by in the water. Moss tries to haul it to land, but the current pulls him into the water. Now he's balancing on the piece of sheet metal, being swept along. It all happens so quickly that it's almost comical. For a little while, we can still see him, but by the time he gets to the corner of Cedros, our eyes can no longer make him out. A few days later, when the evening rush hour was already in full swing, I ran into Moss at the intersection of Kester and Ventura Boulevard. He was distraught, muttering to himself. I learned that a few hours earlier, he had biked to Borders and had left his bike behind the hedge in front of the store. He had gone inside, had listened to music upstairs at one of the listening stations, had had a cup of coffee and looked at a few books. That was all. Not until he was making his way back through the store did it occur to him that he had left his manuscript painstakingly picked up from the floor, put in order and stowed in two file cases, in the basket on the front of his bike. When he got outside, it was gone. Not a trace of the bicycle or the manuscript. Because you didn't actually park your bike there, I said. Am I right? I could tell he wished I were. But, but that's the only place I went, I swear, Moss replied. I went straight from home to the bookstore. So you're sure of that? Yes, I'm, I'm sure. If I lose the manuscript now, it's all over. I, I, if I've lost it, I'm putting an end to this charade. Who'd steal a bike like yours, I asked him. Only a kid, and he'll abandon it sooner than, rather than later. 
You think so? It's quite likely. For a good hour, we searched all the streets around borders from Willis Avenue to Camarillo and back to Hortense Street by way of Natick. Then Cedros, Vesper, and Vista del Monte. Moss pointed out the house where Marilyn Monroe spent her first wedding night. 16 she was at the time. She called her husband daddy, Moss told me. The first photographer she worked with stole her from him. Along the sidewalk, people had put out Christmas trees for the trash pickup. In my mind's eye, I, I kept seeing the foolish image of a child's bike lying on the ground. In movies made in the 50s, the father sees a bike as he turns into the driveway of his single family home. Smiling, he picks it up and parks it neatly by the front door. <sighs> did such things ever happen in real life? Certainly, they no longer did. Shortly before sunset, Moss and I were walking down the long alley behind the Ventura Boulevard shops. We should have looked here first, we agreed. Whoever had stolen the bike would have turned first onto this nameless side street to be out of sight, then would have ditched the manuscript and tossed the file cases somewhere into the garbage cans or bins behind the shops. Moss was still in utter despair. The accumulated memories of the past 20 years, the whole story he wanted to place in Amy's hands someday to justify himself once and for all to his child, and now he had been robbed again. She's the one who stole it, you know, Moss remarked as he held the rickety crate I had climbed onto in order to shine the flashlight we had borrowed from Luce at Noah's into a large trash bin, nothing but garbage and discarded Christmas decorations. Who do you mean? I asked. My wife. She stole Amy from me back in 66, kidnapped her took off, was gone from one day to the next. I was a casting agent at the time on Broadway, had been working there for a couple of years already, not a struggling actor anymore. I was making a good living. We had a five room apartment across from Central Park and she had a fantastic job. She was, Stella was an actress. Stella was appearing in an Edward Albee play. That's where she must have met him. He was a TV writer, came from LA, was just visiting New York. But all that I found out only later. One evening I come home suspecting nothing. No letter, no note. My neighbor says he saw her getting into a cab with a ton of suitcases, her and the child. They were heading to, for Grand Central, that much he was able to pick up. My lawyer tried to calm me down. He wanted to do some investigating. Days passed. My nerves were shot. Stella had never been any good with the child, you know. Too strict for my taste. In some respects, she reminded me of my mother. I thought Amy might really be in danger. I mean, who's crazy enough to run away like that after three years of marriage without a word, without a warning, and leaving not a single trace? robbing me of the thing that means the most to me in the whole world. This child, she knew that was the way to get to me, to deliver a deadly blow. One evening, two weeks had passed, I think, without any word from her and still not a trace of them. When I was meeting some people in connection with my work, they invited me to come along to a dinner party. I said, no, uh, I'm not up to it, but they insisted. An hour later, I was feeling better. The other guests had all listened to me. Amazing. Every one of them, the host and his wife were writers from LA. They rented an apartment in New York while they were doing research, I heard, for a movie, a story about the New York mafia. Burt Lancaster's name was mentioned, as, as was Anthony Quinn's. But Mostly everyone listened to me with great interest and lots of sympathy. I bewailed my plight. Can any of you understand? Yes, they could. 
They showed genuine compassion. When dinner was over, everyone got up. Only one person remained seated. Too drunk to move, I thought. I was also, I, I'd had a few. Uh, the guy sitting at the corner of the table across from me was around 45, not much bigger than me, but with a powerful build. Up to now, I realized he'd hardly said a word, only listened to me and the others. Now he looked straight at me. Some of the guests were leaving, others standing by the bar with the host. Now he looked straight at me and said, why don't you take a contract out on her? A contract? I asked incredulously. Sure, happens all the time, he replied. One day she doesn't come home from work. After that, it won't be long before you have your little darling back. I asked whether he was serious. I thought you were serious, he answered. Yes, but I say, but, but that's crazy. They'd figure out right away who, that's what they wouldn't figure out. You haven't figured it out yourself. You don't know anything. Right now, you don't even know where she's gone with your kid. That was true, I had no idea. It'll cost you 500 bucks, he continued. We need a picture, the name and number of her driver's license. You pay and that's it as far as you're concerned. The money passes through 50 hands in let's say 30 states. No one knows who ordered the hit. One day you get word that you're to come pick up your daughter. That should put a stop to your whining. Can you imagine? Moss continued. I actually considered it. I mean, you can't imagine how humiliated I was, and at the same time, terribly worried about Amy. Think it over, the man said. He gave me the name of an Italian restaurant in the Bronx, the Bruno on Tremont Avenue. He'd be having lunch there on Friday. You go in, sit down, order some food, then you go to the restroom. When I come in, you give me the 500 and return to your table. That's it. The man got up and went to say goodbye to the hosts. I didn't even know his name, but I was sure, absolutely sure, you know, that he would get the job done. I could give him the money and the problem would be solved. The next morning, I'd slept horribly. The whole thing seemed utterly crazy. But towards noon, after I checked with my lawyer, who had no new information, nothing on Stella's and Amy's whereabouts, I, I began toying with the idea again. I, I wasn't sure how long I could keep going. My nerves were shot. Work was almost out of the question. Imaginary scenarios preoccupied me. It'll pass through 30 states, 50 hands, the man had said. I could see him before me, his strong hands, which would write my wife's name and driver's license number on the back of her photo, would stick it in an envelope, toss it in the mail, I thought. No phone call, someone would open the envelope. Where? Somewhere. Outside, the sun is shining, and this next man who doesn't know he's number two, or how does this work? Does he know? At any rate, he sets down his coffee cup next to the photo and balances his lighted cigarette on the saucer. Does he look at the photo? Yeah, but just for a second. The next man will take a longer look, I thought. Maybe in Duluth, Minnesota. He has nothing better to do. It's raining there. He knows the mail came from its postmark Ithaca, New York, Ithaca. Ithaca, he thinks. Ah, that's where I had that thing with that woman called Betty. And he looks at the photo and thinks, she looks a little like her. And then the next guy, the fourth, where does he live? With his mother, she brings him the mail, the paper, the St. Louis dispatch, and a letter from, the rain has blurred everything. The rain in Duluth, Minnesota. No one can make out the postmark, no matter. 
the guy in St. Louis isn't the one either, just sends it on to Flagstaff, Arizona, or Montgomery, Alabama, Monroe, Arkansas, to Pueblo, Colorado, to, hey, why not, Gainesville, Florida, where a driver in a midnight blue Buick waves at my stepsister over the crosswalk. On the passenger side, the photo is lying under a pack of cigarettes and a heavy bunch of keys. And three days later in Wallace, Idaho, a man is splashing cold water on his face after a night of boozing in Spokane. He gives the photo to a young fella whose girlfriend he plans to make a move on in the next few days. I see the young fella in a diner somewhere along the highway. It's nighttime, he's exhausted, has just ordered and is thinking about his girl. He hasn't a clue. He has some time while he waits for his steak with eggs over easy. Coffee, the waitress refills his cup. He wipes his mouth with the, with the paper napkin. He pays on the way out. A brown envelope falls out of his pocket as he takes out his wallet. He picks it up, stuffs it in his side pocket, pulls a 20 out of the wallet. As he does so, I can see five crisp $100 bills tucked in next to it. Whole chains of images like these kept passing before my eyes, as if to reassure me no one's going to make the connection with you. Completely impossible. No evidence will point to you. The trail, that was the tantalizingly reassuring part of these imaginings, the trail got lost in a thicket of details. In these cliches of gangsters, details with which I would have no contact ever. I couldn't conceive what that really meant, pass through 50 hands in 30 states. How did that work? I had no idea. But you could conjure up an endless network, one that extends so far that you lose track, lose track of the fact that it started with you. I wouldn't know anything, I told myself. The whole process would take on a life of its own. The next day, it was the day before the appointed one, I scraped together the money. Normally, I would have had that much on hand, or at least two or three hundred, but she'd taken the money too. A couple of actors owed me 50 or 60 dollars. I withdrew another hundred from the bank, borrowed 50 from various people and so on. At least I was careful not to give myself away, even when I was toying with the idea of going through with it. Careful, I thought. What's to prevent me from checking out the restaurant a day early, having a meal where I was to meet him tomorrow? Can I do that? Could I do that? How would it feel? How does it feel when you go there, do the deed, and leave? And once more, I was already on my way. The whole business seemed completely insane. It wasn't just the plan that was insane. It was the very thought. You're not going to go through with this, Moss McCloud. You won't do it because, and here my fear crystallized, because they'll catch you. Very simple. Still, if someone, if someone would guarantee that, but no one can do that. No one can do that because no one can guarantee anything. And because no one knows about it, no one knows when, where, <laughs> who would want to give me a guarantee? Well, for that reason, I told myself it could actually work. Suddenly, I was standing in front of the restaurant. The smells wafting onto the street were very good, and I was famished. I went inside, sat down at a free table, and ordered. Looked at the other diners, classic types. If one of them had objected to my staring, I could have placated him. In those days, I always had complimentary tickets on me. And who would be offended if you told him you were thinking of casting him in a Broadway play? I was enjoying my food and was almost finished when it occurred to me that this was a last meal of sorts, or at least could be, if I took the plunge the next day and came back with the money. A last meal, a last something, something final. 
I got up and went to the men's room. I'd almost forgotten that part. I was alone in the men's room, stood there, washed my hands, pictured myself. I reached into my pocket, handing him the money quickly, painlessly, no envelope, nothing to get in the way of his counting it then and there, if he wanted to. No one would see. He'd go into the stall, and in the meantime, I'd wash my hands, dry them thoroughly, back to the dining room. I paid the check and made my way home by a roundabout route, thinking, all right, how did that feel? Answer, not that bad, really. Besides, I had all kinds of things to attend to. Appointments, I had no time for complicated thoughts and wouldn't have the next day either. It was a normal day and tomorrow would be a normal day too. On the weekend now, that, that might be different. That was when it would hit home. Okay, but you, you could arrange to be with people. And there was no shortage of actors and actresses dying to meet me. Invitations arrived daily. Most of them I turned down, but, but, but what if there were problems? If my nerves got the best of me tomorrow after lunch? Well, I could let down my guard, accept a couple of invitations, I thought just to help me over the hump, and also to let myself be seen. I could take Harold along to a few events, my lawyer, why not, a boring guy, boring guy, and later, but that's something I didn't find out right away, he'd really make colossal mistakes. Harold always wanted to meet people, especially women, a boring guy, but uh, in that respect, insatiable. I'd get through the next few weeks somehow, then I was certain after some time had passed, it would be as though nothing had happened. And not until the call came, the call, the call that I couldn't avoid. I had to be ready. The night before the rendezvous, I didn't sleep a wink, or at least that's how it felt. The next morning I was a wreck at a dim memory of an awful dream, something sinister. I'd gone down to a cellar with a mafioso. I knew it was a cellar in his house, and he pulls on a string, turning on a naked bulb, and then he bends backward in this harsh light, hollowing out his back, supporting himself on some crates, which slip back a little, making a terrible grating sound. Yes, he bends backwards, positioning his throat under the light, offering it to me. And in my dream, I know that I have to cut my finger. Cutting your finger is part of the ritual here. I have to hold my bleeding finger over him, over this guy who will open his mouth and my blood has to drip into it. And as he receives my blood and swallows it, I know I have been made, am one of them, an awful dream. I went to work determined to forget the whole business. No sooner had I arrived at the office than my secretary told me that the producer I was scheduled to see at two o'clock had canceled and we should try to move something else into that time slot. But then I hear myself saying, no, don't bother, I'm going out for lunch. I'll be back around three. The rendezvous was to take place at one o'clock. And just before 12.30, I set out. I had to hurry, I took a cab. We made good time at first, but then of course we hit traffic. I paid and got out, started to run. I knew it wasn't far, just around the next corner. I pass a bank and see my reflection in the plate glass window rushing towards my destination, my hands in my pants pockets, Sinatra style. And I realized completely insane. The large pane provided just enough of a reflection. The light was right for me to catch a glimpse of myself. And I stopped, stopped dead, looked at myself in that sea of glass, saw my eyes, the eyes of a stranger staring back at me. I was so unrecognizable that it horrified me. I turned away. 
just a half turn to the door, took one step, then another, went into the bank, made my way to the teller, and deposited the money, the whole 500, into my account, took the stamped deposit slip, and stuck it in my wallet, just to remind myself of how close I'd come, to remind God and myself, to remind him of how close he had let me come, but also myself, that at this moment, I was sacrificing any certainty of seeing my daughter again. The stamped slip represented proof, if you like, of my pact with him. I was making this sacrifice because, well, in the last analysis of my own free will, I had seen something crazy. That reflection put there to let him see the truth. He was the crazy one. I think he saw himself in me at this moment, saw himself in my plans, and was prepared to empty out his vessel of anger. That's what I had recognized. I hurried out of the bank and knew in my heart, now you're free of that. That and the rest too. And I can tell you the pain the pain I felt at the thought that I might never see Amy again is something I wouldn't wish on anyone. I kept walking, passing the spot that had decided everything. The sun was at a different angle now, or maybe a cloud was blocking it. At any rate, nothing caught my attention. This time I glanced at the bank window because I, because I wanted to see again what I'd recognized. But as I said, the window was no longer reflecting. The light had changed. It can't have been that I no longer had the money. So I passed the spot, then forced myself around the next corner instead of turning back and catching the first cab, you understand. Walked to the corner and made the turn. The restaurant where we were supposed, where we were supposed to meet was only a block away. I, I headed in that direction. Should I really do this, I wondered. What if he recognizes me as I walk past, runs after me? Ridiculous, complete nonsense. Nonetheless, I stopped. And then I saw, no more than 20 or 30 yards away, a small crowd gathering. And on the other side of the street, a photographer. He'd taken pictures for me once, but uh, I hadn't heard from him in a long time. He, he runs across the street and I go up to him. What's happening down there? He said he'd received a phone call. Come with me, let's go and see. And we're allowed through. The police haven't arrived yet, but we can hear sirens approaching. Now, I'm standing at the entrance to the restaurant at the very spot where I stood the previous day before I went in and looked for a table. The diner's motionless, still in shock. I see blood on the floor, a pool that's growing, see two men lying there. One of them I recognize immediately, yes, the one I was supposed to meet. He must have been some kind of bodyguard. And the other one, I, I don't recall his name. A, a man had come in, fired three or four shots, then left the restaurant. And by the table over there, they, they'd been sitting at the same table as the victims, stood my hosts from two days ago. The woman, hysterical, her, her dress spattered with blood. Not her blood, no, no, not hers. The people whose dinner party I'd attended They'd been having lunch with one of these men, a mafioso they'd met in the course of doing research for their screenplay. The whole thing had gone down not five minutes earlier. My knees still tremble when I remind myself of that. This mob hit, as it was later described in the papers, had taken place no more than five minutes ago. If the light striking the bank's window, if that cloud in the sky had passed over the sun. Just imagine, what a crazy thought. If the wind driving the cloud had been a bit stronger and the sun had been hidden a moment sooner, I wouldn't have stopped. 
wouldn't have seen anything in the window, or at least not enough to stop me in my tracks. I'd have gone around the corner and entered the restaurant just as it was happening. And that's what you described in your manuscript for Amy? I asked Moss. Yes, the plain truth, Moss replied. I didn't want Amy to think I was trying to make myself look good. I had these thoughts. I had this opportunity. I struggled with the decision and I made it. She has to know that. She has to know how far a person, no, 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 how far I, her father, almost went. Can you understand that? Later, I asked myself, what would have happened if I'd given the man, if I'd borrowed the money right away from the people who dragged me to that party? Then everything would have been taken care of that very evening. Such things happen. Another man might not have hesitated, and he would have had a chance, a good chance, not to lose what I lost. You can't imagine. This whole business had enormous consequences. Two or three days after the rendezvous, or after that bloodbath, I, I heard from Harold, my lawyer. He found them, Amy and my wife, and the man with whom she'd run away to LA. So I, I learned who it was. He, we had a house in Brentwood, top-notch lawyers, a good name in the industry, which at the time didn't make me jealous. I had a good name myself, but in the end, what did a man's name mean if he took away another man's wife and his child too? Why not to keep her happy? He had plenty of money and two children from a previous marriage. Huh? A hard worker, but not a workaholic, people said, known for being punctual and reliable when it came to getting a job done, always knew what was hip, what was in. I think he was involved in the Monkeys series, which was playing on TV at the time. Well, well liked, well liked, and in the right circles. An Emmy, a couple of Golden Globes on his mantelpiece, a, a beach house in Malibu. Occasional drug use, not the hard stuff, and nothing that can be proved, so not usable in a custody challenge, Harold told me. For the time being, I focused on other matters. I, I'd done the right thing, I thought. I, I'd prevented a murder, or that was how it could be seen. I had the locks to our apartment on Central Park changed, moved out, taking a room in a small hotel, and sent Stella the new keys. Here, these are for you. The whole apartment belongs to you and the child, I wrote. But please come back. Do it for Amy, come back to New York. Nothing, no reply, no reaction at all. She didn't take me up on it. And as I said, she had better lawyers, it became clear to me. Uh, I should have changed mine, but Harold stalled me. Finally, he convinced me that it would look better in court if I had an apartment in Los Angeles. For the child's sake, you can't ask a child to get on a plane every weekend. Her lawyers, it's true, told me from the beginning, you're never going to see Amy again. Let it go. Spare yourself the aggravation. The aggravation, yes. Everything was going downhill. I don't even remember why or what the specifics were. My agency wasn't getting the right contracts anymore. I, it was my fault, no doubt about it. Uh, nothing interested me, God knows. I was preoccupied with other things. Suddenly the money was gone and I had to sell the apartment on Central Park. I bought it for $5,000. Now I got 125,000 for it. Who knows what it would be worth today? Two or three million at least. And I lost everything, risked everything and lost it all. Over the years, I must have spent more than 100,000 on lawyers. I moved to LA, first to Beverly Hills, then to Studio City, and for the last 15 years, I've been here in Sherman Oaks. At first, it looked as though things would turn out all right for me. The court recognized the trouble I'd gone to, saw that I sold everything, and 
followed the wife who'd abandoned me and taken the child, all so I could see my daughter now and then. Three days a week. That was the deal. The judge's ruling. By now, Amy was seven. Seven. And it went fine for a year. And my wife, my ex-wife, came out with this terrible, this terrible accusation. Someone must have suggested it to her. Just do that and he'll be forced to clear himself. In the end, they'll rule in your favor. Some suspicion always sticks. She accused me of molesting Amy. Took me to court with that lie. That's when I lost her. Never saw her again. It's true. It's true that one time I did ask Amy to rub my back. So what? It was hurting. And it made me feel better when she massaged it a bit. So what? I ask you. So what? One time I, I kissed her goodnight. But God, I always kissed her goodnight. I, I loved her. Always loved her. That child was everything to me. She was in bed and the blanket slid over her leg. And I kissed her on the thigh, then pulled the blanket over her. That's all. One time. Completely innocuous. But her mother must have made a point of grilling her every time she came back from a visit. Amy, does daddy kiss you? Okay, where does he kiss you? So she took Amy from me. The court ruled in her favor and I... I'd lost once and for all. And it hurts so much when I consider that Amy might, I mean, it's imperative that she know there was no abuse, that I always loved her, that her mother tried to turn her against me with all kinds of lies, that, that I risked everything and would do so again. You know what? I'd do it again. At least I think so. I, I, I'd spend all my money and try to get her back. What else could I do? What choice would I have? On the other hand, my wife can praise her lucky stars that that after dinner conversation in New York, that, that, that it didn't take place after she accused me of abuse. She really lucked out. We all lucked out, I think. And you never ran into her, your wife? I, I mean, just by chance? No, I never ran into her again. <laughs> she had a successful career. It's the ultimate irony. And tells you more about Hollywood than about her. As a TV writer, and the woman couldn't write. She couldn't even write a check and won an Emmy. I assume he wrote the script and put her name on the title page, maybe for tax reasons. What do I know? Bam, that's how it goes. Another Emmy on the mantelpiece. She can't put two sentences together, that woman. No, no, thank God I, I, I never ran into her again. By the way, the first time, the first time we saw each other, the, 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 the same thing happened. I, I thought it just wasn't meant to be, wasn't meant to lead to anything. The whole story was completely crazy. As I said, there are Always signs and portents. But that I already knew at the time, at the time, at the time. That was, uh, wait, it was in 62, must have been August, shortly after Marilyn died. In 62, I was still an actor. <laughs> that was, well, that was what I was until just before Amy was born. Then I gave it up. Things went quite well for me. A casting agent offered me a job in his agency, taught me the ropes. All right, so at the time, I was still an actor. I went for an audition. I still remember the play. It was that Wilder play, Our Town. George and, uh, what was the name of the female lead? George and Emily, that was it. We were both auditioning, Stella and I. We didn't know each other yet, but uh, the two of us were assigned a scene. Sit down in the corner there and uh, we'll call you in. We had 10 minutes to rehearse together, to go over the lines. Our town. 
have the faintest idea why they would still be putting on that play in the 60s. Oh, well, it was the early 60s. At any rate, we sat down and read through the scene, the one in the drugstore. We come in, sit down, I order something for us, and she waits for me to declare my love. Well, that's how I think it went. I'm not so sure anymore. At any rate, there we were, huddled in our corner. She was very friendly. I'd left my glasses at home and was having a hard time making out the text. Uh, she read it to me without getting impatient and kept saying, look at me, forget the text. The others will forget it too if we really wow them, if they can feel what's between us. And the minute we got through the scene, we started again and man, there was something, something happening between us. No doubt about it. She looked into my eyes and there was something there. I have no idea what she saw. My God, my God Stella, what did you see back then? What madness life is. Stella looked at me. I, I spoke to her and said uh, what George says, that uh, I won't leave our town won't look for a job anywhere else, because why should I? I? I found everything I was looking for. Here, you, you. And more I don't want. All I want is you. And at that, I'm telling you, she gives me a kiss. It was... <sighs> I never... Man, this is crazy. That I'm remembering it now under these circumstances but I don't think I ever experienced anything like that again. It wasn't in the script that kiss Emily gave George. And she wasn't a fleeting kiss. No, not at all. She moved her face a little, tilted it towards me, and suddenly she was very close, intentionally, provocatively close. And then she gave me that kiss. And the kiss was... How should I put it? Filled with infinite gratitude for what I just said. The, the lines, George has to speak. Now, now that I found you, I never want to leave. Her answer came in the form of that kiss. Her gratitude was erotic, you know? Gratitude for having been really understood. As if up to then, finding understanding had been only a hope. Gratitude that she'd arrived finally. That her life had become real. I, both of us, we were swept off our feet. Our ears were burning when they called us in for our audition. I... I have no idea what they thought of us. We were probably speaking much too softly from the beginning, paying no attention to technique, still completely under the spell of what we accomplished outside. And what had we accomplished? What did it mean? Damn, what wouldn't I give to know? What in the world was it? The directors interrupted us several times. Louder, please. Then sent us on our way. It was clear we didn't have a shot, but uh, I couldn't get that woman out of my mind. I was besotted with her, as you can imagine, so, so bowled over by what had happened in that moment that when I walked her to the bus, I didn't even ask for her phone number. I didn't know her name. Or did I? Did I know it already? Doesn't matter. At any rate, I didn't have a phone number or an address. The number of the bus, yes, but it was long gone. And that was it. That would have been it. No, that's how it should have been. And I'd still remember that moment, that instant, even if I'd never seen Stella again. And then, wait, one or two months passed. It was October. I just turned 33. We all thought our final hour had struck. 
literally. It was during the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis, during that one week in October 62, the, the crisis was building from day to day. Kennedy had found out that the Russians had installed launch pads for mid-range missiles in Cuba. They can reach every city, every larger city in North and South America from there, we heard. Nuclear war. And about 20 Russian ships and submarines were on their way to deliver more rockets. That was the situation. And, and Kennedy says, stop, and takes the whole thing to the American people. A major address on television, speeches on the radio. We see what's going on, or as always, think we see what's going on. He orders a blockade of Cuba. Nothing can get through, not a ship, not a plane, we're told. And in the meantime, the Russian ships are streaming towards us. I mean, towards the blockade. A confrontation is inevitable. Tomorrow, we say, or sometime tonight. Then all hell will break loose because no one can back down. High noon off the shores of Cuba. And we've known this for days. We've lived it. And we sense that it can't turn out well. Khrushchev, those reds, they'll stop at nothing. Reds, that says it all. They're going to go ahead and press the button. Everyone is sure of that. All over. All over, just when things were looking up. Better days, freedom just around the corner, all over, the end of the world. Bombs will be dropped, the first on New York. Everyone's glued to the television, to the radio, hoping and praying that maybe, just maybe. But most people can feel it in their bones. This time we've had it. We won't get out of this alive. And some of us go to the plaza that evening, the fanciest hotel in New York. I'm there with a woman I know and a few close friends. We decide to get totally smashed in the oak room, dark and elegant and far too expensive for us. But what does it matter? No one will live past this night. We're convinced of that, completely convinced. So we're sitting in the plaza, our whole group at one table, and the other tables are full, all full too. Uh, People have accepted the situation. They're with their best friends, ordering glass after glass and, and listening to the radio. Everywhere in the Oak Room, radios have been set up. No television, radios. So, so we listen, talk about the impending nuclear war. Any minute may be our last. And on the radio, they keep reporting how far the Russian boats are from the blockade line. So. You can calculate when the first boats will get there. Another 425 miles, 354 miles, 290, only 175. Unbelievably nerve wracking. And we're downing one martini after another. I, I don't recall how long this went on because at some point I stood up. I, I, I wasn't properly drunk yet. No. I had a bite to eat beforehand. Maybe it was the excitement, the adrenaline. Anyway, I, I got up and headed for the men's room, and passed a table, one of the tables on the other side of the room. And there she sat, Stella, with a couple of men, a couple of girlfriends. And she saw me too, saw me immediately. She's all dressed up, something Black and white, don't ask me. It rustled softly when she turned her neck. She, yes, she came towards me. And I saw clearly, what was it? What was it in that moment? We spoke to each other without, we didn't have to say a word. We read them in each other's eyes. So we meet again. But we won't have the chance, that's what I read in her eyes, won't have the gift of living together. It's now or never. These minutes may be all we have. Listen, Amy. Moss was speaking directly to me. If anyone tells you this story, maybe it will be my friend here who went looking for my manuscript with me the manuscript I wrote for you. 
Moss stared at me, his eyes never wavering from my face. But we didn't find it, Amy, not a trace. This friend of mine will tell you the story when I'm dead and gone. He'll tell you what happened that night when I took her by the hand, your mother. We went upstairs where I'd asked for a room. We didn't say a word. We just clung to each other's hands, not a word. And that night, Amy, I'm telling you, when no one thought we had a chance in hell, when we'd all given up, I saw her and she saw me and I loved that woman, Amy, I loved her. He'll describe it for you. How all that matters is that moment when we drew you into life and you were with us, conceived that night. We were all there together. By now it was completely dark. Moss and I were standing in the unlit alley behind the shops on Ventura Boulevard. We had long since given up the search, but Moss had dragged me along, drawing me deeper into his story with every word, holding me captive. He had spoken to me as if every word were testimony. And now I could see it as he finished speaking. They were standing before him, the woman and his daughter. He had them back. At this moment, in this moment of conception, Moss had gathered in all he had lost and found it complete. He had collected his life around him and said, you are both here, nothing is missing. And nothing was missing. And Moss glowed in the light of his visitation. Thank you for listening so patiently.
Hello, everyone. Let me first of all thank Judy Kaufman for her careful preparation of the program and also to Virginia Barrett for the invitation to the Young Club of Orange County. I'm very honored. I would also like to extend my gratitude to Holly Fincher for bringing us together. Now that you've listened to the story, Solar Eclipse, you may ask yourself what to make of it, how to understand this. Let me give you a brief overview of the content of my presentation. There are three main features in Patrick Roth's way of storytelling. I'm going to talk about all three of them. The first feature is the emotional impact. For us readers or listeners, it is as if we were there on the scene, in the movie, so to speak. Everything is very immediate. We are always close to the action, close to the characters. This has to do with the narrator. He pulls us in. In the second part of my lecture, I will shed some light on the function of the narrator. I think his role has something or even a lot in common with the function of a psychotherapist. The other central feature of Patrick Roth's way of storytelling is his continuous referring to the archetypal background. I'm sure you noticed this while you were listening. Underneath the everydayness of this starlight terrace world, this our worldly layer, <clears throat> so to speak, there is a second somehow mythical or archetypal layer. As you also may have realized, solar eclipse is a very densely woven fabric of images and illusions. I find it interesting to dissect this dense fabric and will draw out some of the various threads of reference. I think the main issue around which most of the themes and motives center is the problem of the anima. I will point this out in a third part of my lecture. The third feature I will be discussing is individuation. I have observed that the plot of Patrick Roth's stories follows the structure of the individuation process. Another term of Jungian psychology with, with which you are all familiar with. In Edward Edinger's book on Greek myths, he defines the term individuation in a nutshell. Quote, individuation and the growth of consciousness are really the same thing, unquote. Solar eclipse presents the drama of an individuation. That is, everything revolves around the transformation of the hero. It is triggered by an, en by an encounter with the dark god. It is to this kind of an experience that changes all and that eclipses all others that the story uh, Solar Eclipse alludes to, that the story title Solar Eclipse alludes to. I will explain this in the fourth part of my lecture. You've just listened to my brief overview. I have prepared a PowerPoint presentation, but I won't use it. I think it's distracting 
most PowerPoint presentations are in my mind. If you are interested in the quotes I'm referring to from time to time, interested in a citation of the sources, I can furnish them for you. Simply email me. The same goes for further questions or comments. Just email me. I think I'm not sure, but uh, maybe we should have the, my email address up in uh, during the break. Okay, so the first part of my lecture will last 60 minutes. The second part will last 50 minutes. This means that we will finish a little earlier and we will have enough time for Q&A. Now you can just lean back and listen. I start with some general remarks about the composition of Stylite Terrace. And then I proceed to the analyzing the figure of the narrator. So first part, structure of the story, and then figure of the narrator. Solar Eclipse is the second story in a four part narrative cycle entitled Starlight Terrace. This is also the name of the apartment complex arranged around a swimming pool somewhere in Los Angeles where the four protagonists and the narrator live. The book Starlight Terrace was first published in German in 2004 and the English translation came out in 2012. The book is about four stories. One could also say about four individuations of people in or beyond midlife whose thoughts, feelings, and actions are influenced to a high degree by movies and the movie industry. Projections, especially on movie stars and movies, play a correspondingly large role in the psyche of these people. The fifth figure in this quaternio of four is the narrator himself. He remains nameless, but we can infer from his comments that he is a German writer who has lived in Los Angeles for a long time. Behind the narrator is, of course, the author, Patrick Roth. His life story and his personal experiences with the city of movies and the movie milieu. In this book, he conveys, uh, he conveys to us the stories and experiences he collected in conversations with the four residents of Starlight Terrace, Rex, Mars, Gary, and June, before shaping them into four narratives. Thus, in Starlight Terrace, we are dealing with literary fiction that relies heavily on biographical and autobiographical facts. In a recent interview I did with Patrick Roth, I asked him how real his characters are. My question was, quote, the world you create in your book, Starlight Terrace, seems tremendously authentic. The protagonists appear to be cut from life. Did you find people like that in Los Angeles? He answered in a long, very interesting statement. I quote, Patrick, oh yes, I was especially fascinated by the so-called inconspicuous people on the fringes of Hollywood, the employees or freelancers in the film industry. You can across them by chance, at a wedding, a party, in coffee shops, or you find out that your neighbor used to work in film for decades. 
The stars, on the other hand, whom I had to interview so often as a film journalist, were mostly boring. They always had their stories down pat. You couldn't explore unknown spaces with them. But the unimposing bit player who had once moved to LA to make it big here as an actor, screenwriter, director, always had something to tell. They came with high hopes, just wanted to be close to the fire. There's definitely a parallel to that saying of Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas, he who near me is near the fire. And indeed, one senses that their ardent hopes sometimes have a religious quality. That, albeit unconsciously, a religious dimension is being touched here. Interestingly, my conversations with people who often arrive at a certain point, would often arrive at a certain point, a memory of the moment when their hopes were shattered. And listening, you experienced this crushing event in their retelling. It is as if it were happening to them again. And that moment, you see the depth of truth in that person. There is no pretension left. Everything bursts away, falls away. And this highly human core that suddenly becomes visible, you will love it immediately. And if you as a listener have received it correctly, then perhaps it dawns on the other that his or her experience, the lived one and the real lived one, has not been in vain. Just the opposite, that it has a tremendous value. They see it in you, in the way you react to this moment on their story, their story. Because in that one moment of recognition, if it is consciously captured just once, this is the function of the one who listens intently, there is a transforming power a transforming power. That was the decisive aspect for me in such conversations, the valuable thing." Unquote. Well, I think here you have a key to understand the Starlight Terrace tales. The stories of Starlight Terrace can be, can be read individually and on their own. But at the same time, they form a cycle as four separate parts. That is, they are connected by a common theme and a continuous development, which reaches its climax in the fourth story entitled The Woman in the Sea of Stars. It is interesting to follow the unfolding of certain themes uh, and associated motives through the book in their stages as they coalesce towards a center of meaning that emerges gradually. Externally, the cycle is held together by the unity of place, time, and action, which gives it the feel of a classical Greek drama in four acts. The stories take place in Starlight Terrace over the course of a year from June 2002 to June 2003. The four characters are thus inhabitants of the same cosmos. The figure of the narrator who appears in every story and functions as a superior fifth character also forms a constant factor. Like a medieval chronicler, this narrator initially takes a back seat to his characters 
in order to let them have their say and to make himself as invisible as possible. And yet, as the secret director, he holds the reins of the entire drama in his hands. We only see the Stylai Terrace world through his subjective glasses. If one wanted to describe the function of the narrator, one would have to call him an eager collector of live shards, which he assembles into four individuation stories. As a writer, he gives form, order and direction to the experiences of his protagonists, which have fragmented into a thousand images and stories. This is why the role of the narrator for the four residents of Starlight Terrace can hardly be underestimated. It is through the narrator's seeing and understanding through his sympathy and empathy that the heroes, dissociated as they are, experience, experience meaning in life and glimpse something of the myth they unconsciously live. What is distinctive and remarkable about the four stories is how the narrator succeeds in revealing the archetypal psyche emerging behind the singular individual fate, which gives these so-called ordinary people a dignity they have long lost ever since in everyday life. The narrator in Starlight Terrace acts on the one hand as a neutral and objective reporter. But on the other hand, he intervenes in the narrated world at decisive moments. At these junctures of interaction, it becomes particularly clear that the narrator is mirrored in his characters, or rather that the protagonists represent portions of his own personality. In Starlight Terrors, the outer and inner worlds, consciousness and unconscious, are not isolated areas standing side by side. Instead, they intertwine in incessantly, forming the famous two, uh, two sides of a coin. One might also describe it this way. Behind the outer concrete reality, there is hidden a secret inner world, which lies within the narrator. This inner psychic symbolic realm of the collective unconscious finds expression primarily in dreams, which are woven into the plot from time to time. These are predominantly the dreams of the narrator in which the Starlight Terrace inhabitants appear precisely as personified aspects of his psyche. In Solar Eclipse 2, a meaningful dream is inserted immediately before the long conversation between the narrator and the character of Moss. In it, the narrator's ego, accompanied by an unknown woman, stands at the bedroom window at night and watches as Moss tries to cross the street which has been transformed into a raging river. A short time later, Moss clings to the door wing of a car and is swept away by the current. He slips out of sight. Moss represents, it becomes evident here, a shadow aspect of the narrator. It seems as if such neglected, unlived inferior content is seen 
and felt in the writing. It also seems as if this very fact helps the narrator's consciousness to understand the sufferings of the shadow and the problems of the anima on a depth level. Okay, so this was my analysis of the narrator and his function. And now I come to my second chapter uh, entitled Recollection. Solar eclipse revolves around the anima problem of modern man. For this reason alone, it makes sense to read the story from a depth psychological angle as a literary case history, if you will. So let's first take a look at the facts. The hero, Moss McLeod, lives like an old bachelor in a run-down one-room apartment in Starlight Terrace. In the early 1960s, he was an actor in New York and later a casting agent in Los Angeles. He met his wife, Stella, while auditioning for a theater role. From his marriage with her, he has a daughter, Amy. Since the divorce, which took place some 40 years ago, Moss has lost contact with his wife and daughter. His despair and longing for the feminine are accordingly great. Right at the beginning of the story, we encounter the archetypal motive of the lost daughter. At the crack of dawn, Moss asks the narrator to look for his daughter in the street fronting the Starlight Terrace apartment complex. Moss does so in the belief that Amy has rung his doorbell. But the narrator can't find her anywhere. The archetype of this situation comes from the Demeter or Persephone myth. You remember, Hades had fallen madly in love with Cori, which is ancient Greek for girl, a daughter of Zeus and Demeter. Zeus allowed it, and so one day Hades, god of the underworld, ascended and abducted the young girl as she was picking flowers in a meadow. With his team of horses, he swept her off to his underworldly realm where the sun never shines. Up on earth, however, the despairing mother wandered around searching for days. Demeter's grief over the stolen daughter was so great that plants stopped growing and the earth was threatened with great famine. Moss too suffers fiercely from the loss of his girl. And yet it is not clear at first whether she really exists, his daughter, or is a product of his imagination. Each new day, Moss is waiting for Amy's visit. And each new day, his hope of ever seeing her again is dashed. The real cause of the, let's call it the daughter neurosis is Stella. She left Moss for another man in the third year of their marriage, taking Amy, their young daughter with her into the new relationship she has formed on the West Coast. Ultimately, Moss lost Amy in the divorce proceedings when he was stripped of custody at the instigation of the vindictive wife. Moss is thus much worse off than what is shown in the myth where Zeus 
negotiated a deal with Hades so that Corey could spend nine months of each year on Earth. For Moss McLeod, on the other hand, the loss of his girl is all consuming. Moss's life problem is obviously grounded in his split from the anima, protected unto the woman and especially the daughter he idolizes. His story dramatizes the question of how a man can confront the difficult problem of the anima and find a relationship with his feminine side. We know the pattern from Goethe's Faust drama. Much like Faust, Moss does not know what the anima is. Like Faust, Moss has to go to the lowest hell to find out the secret. Throughout his life, he has only ever searched on the outside and therefore has been unable to resolve the projection. Only when the narrator, who is also Moss's neighbor in Starlight Terrace, joins him in the search, does the knot begin to unravel. The inciting incident for this decisive turnaround is a second loss. One day, Moss discovers that the manuscript he has been writing for 20 years has been stolen from him. A manuscript he carries around with him in two folders like a fetish. It is an autobiographical account in which he tries to explain his, his failed marriage and at the same time tries to justify his own behavior. The intended recipient, uh, uh, recipient, sorry, the intended, the intended recipient of this ma manuscript was the daughter. By it, she was to know that Moss had always loved her. The manuscript is basically a confession meant to replace for Amy the father she never had. But then Moss loses this manuscript. In a moment of unconsciousness, it is stolen from him. Stolen just like the daughter had been stolen from him. It is implied that he even suspects Stella of having stolen the manuscript from him, an absurd accusation that well reveals his projection. The woman is to him the wicked bitch who has messed up his life. In this situation of defeat and despair, the narrator enters the scene and offers his help to Moss. As the two of them comb through the trash dumpsters in the dark alley behind Ventura Boulevard, searching for the lost manuscript, Moss spontaneously begins to talk about Stella and her wicked deeds. He launches into a long monologue in which he gets all of his misfortune off his chest, this tremendous weight of his soul. What Moss doesn't yet know is the fact that his oral storytelling is actually already a recapturing, a recollection of what he has just lost. He does not suspect that it is his impassioned speech that brings the repressed events and feelings back to life before his eyes. Indeed, by the living recounting he gives, 
all those contents that had been split off for decades are reconnected to his consciousness. One may say that Patrick Roth uses his mouse figure to demonstrate the healing effect of oral narration directed at an interested listener. This is because the telling of one's own life story is always a gathering and a piecing together of events that happen to us seemingly arbitrarily and therefore appear to be completely meaningless. But in this innocent, unintentional collecting and retelling of the fragments of one's own life, there is already the possibility of taking back the projection. If a listener is present, from whose reactions the person who is collecting can gain new insights. Oral storytelling thus amounts to a process anticipating the recollection of a projection. Because a listener is present, the narrated contents can come closer to consciousness so that in the most favorable case, the projection can be dissolved. I think something along those li these lines is happening with Moss. When he remembers the events with Stella and gives them verbal expression, the memories and feelings associated with her come closer to consciousness, which is why his image of Stella also begins to change during the narrative process. That is during his act of telling his story. If at the beginning Stella was the woman without talents who cheated and stole from him, a despicable bitch only concerned with her advantage, by the end of his search, she has transformed into the woman he deeply loved and cherished. From analytical work, we know resolution of the projection is a prerequisite for recovery the anima, as seen from the male point of view. So what happens in Mars as he descends, remembering and narrating, as he sinks into his personal unconscious? One could say a center begins to form around which the shattered fragments of his life arrange themselves. At the end of his speech, Moss penetrates this initially unrecognizable center. Quote, you are both here, unquote, he speaks at last, and Quote, nothing is missing, unquote. With these words, Moss addresses his companion, the narrator, directly, speaking as though he were the finally found again Amy. Through narration, as a way of exposing or extracting psychic contents that are haunting and tormenting him, Mars has broken through to Stella, has recreated her in a remembering, gathering way. The fact that Mars addresses her directly proves her aliveness. He has resurrected her by the way of remembering and describing, and now in his mind's eye sees her before him. Therefore, one can speak of this ending as a classic anachnoresis, anachnoresis, 
a typical scene of recognition. So anachnoresis means recognition. Masses recognition implies errors, the relation function. This is reflected in his romantic description of the night of love with Stella. The feeling is reconnected. The feeling function is back. Viewed from the end of the story, it is the initially fatal, fatal loss of the written down and recorded life story that triggers Mas's search, his journey. Without this mishap, the narrator would not have intervened and nothing would have happened. From this, we see that behind the external events, there is you could say a mysterious power at work, subliminally, subliminally guiding the hero's process, the hero's process. This hidden power is already evident in the opening scene, namely in Marcy's request that the narrator walk out into the street and search for Amy. The narrator can't find her anywhere, and that makes him aware of the confused elderly gentleman that is Moss. The same power is behind the second purposeful encounter outside the appropriately named Borders bookstore that triggers Moss's great recollection and which ultimately leads him to the anima. The same individuation dynamic is fueling the narrative rage that overtakes Moss and engages him in a long monologue, as furious as it is inspired, with countless embedded stories, digressions, and impressions, a monologue that ultimately leads him to healing. Literary scholars refer to the configuration we encounter in Solar Eclipse, namely of a narrator who tells a second separate story within a story as an intradiegetic narrative situation. Intradiegetic, meaning the voice is inside the text. The physician and psychotherapist, on the other hand, would recognize this configuration as anamnesis. Anamnesis, this is Greek and means recollection. Jung used the term anamnesis in its original platonic sense. When we, when we acquire consciousness, knowledge, our learning is a recollection of prenatal knowledge. But this means all our cognition is nothing more than a recognition, a memory of what we once knew and now have forgotten. This archetypal theme is essential to Jungian analysis, which is just that, an intentional, orderly process of recollection that begins with the memory of the personal life and then delves deeper. Jung himself described the importance of anamnesis in his memoirs. Quote, in many cases in psychiatry, the patient who comes to us has a story that is not told and which as a rule, no one knows of. To my mind, therapy only really begins after the investigation of that whole personal story. It is the patient's secret, the rock against which he is shattered. 
if I know his secret story, I have a key to the treatment. The doctor's task is to find out how to gain that knowledge. In therapy, the problem is always the whole person, never the symptom alone. We must ask questions which challenge the whole personality. Unquote. The authenticity of a person, the core of his being, lies in the honestly told life story, which is why it is so valuable. At the same time, it contains holy scripture, insofar as the psyche has inscribed itself in it. It is Edinger, he puts it this way, quote, every careful analysis starts with a detailed history of the patient. I think of such a beginning as the reading of the scriptures of that person's life. So I study an individual's history the same way I study the books of the Old Testament. I always try to be on the lookout for evidence of a transpersonal purpose in an individual's life story." Unquote. The traces of the self are found in the emotionally charged situations of a life. I think this is so important that I repeat it. The traces of the self, so you could say the traces of God, are found in the emotionally charged situations of a life. The therapeutic conversation is about finding these sensitive places marked by affect and giving them narrative expression. Moss's account maps the emotions well. The hatred for Stella is evident, as is the revenge-driven criminal plot to get back his daughter. Also the feelings of shock and horror before the dark god in the bank window, you remember, which cause him to back away or the sudden affection he feels for Stella. All these strong feelings are signatures of the self, which have touched him here, have intervened here. It is no accident that Moss's story consists almost entirely of a dialogue between the, broad, uh, the protagonist and the narrator. However, the dialogue structure, which still comprises two thirds of the narrative's total length, is not visible on the surface of the text because the narrator's questions and comments have been almost entirely removed in order to focus on Moss's character, who, aided by the patient listener, is working himself out of his darkness, as it were. By remembering and telling his personal story in the presence of the narrator, who is also neighbor through the shadow, that is, Moss is in a sense, in a sense, heals himself. One can, if one wishes, see Solar Eclipse as a tribute to the healing power of storytelling. At the same time, it is a story in which the female element is missing. The female element appears only as seen through the lens of the male and remains entirely in the background of the plot. The absence of the feminine indicates the necessary task of integrating it. 
It is therefore no coincidence that the Moss story begins with the search for the daughter and deals with the approach to the anima, how to come closer to it. Okay, now I proceed to my next chapter and this is the anima problem. Moss embodies the prototype of the abandoned man who is torn out of his quiet life path by his wife's adultery and is thus confronted with the anima problem. Doubts are awakened and his previous views and convictions break down. The infidelity of the woman on the outside in real life is compounded by the inner situation of midlife, which per se demands a fundamental transformation of, of consciousness. As we know, the anima represents the soul image of the man, his feminine side, which is compensatory to the conscious attitude. It acts, this feminine side acts as a bridge to the deep-seated sensual wholeness of his personality. Marie-Louise von Franz describes it this way, quote, as we know the feminine side of the unconscious in a man mediates the relationship to the deep-seated, meaningful wholeness of his personality. If a man heeds this element of feeling, which is also involved in his relationships with women, rather than rejecting it as nonsense, he can only cause it to be more favorably disposed toward him. In this way, he becomes inspired and acquires wings in reaching his goals." Unquote. Moss has so far disregarded or outsourced his emotional side to the woman, his wife and his daughter. As long as the anima is unconscious, and it usually remains so until the second half of life, it is experienced exclusively in projection. The conflict with Stella has thrown Mars back on himself. In such a situation, it is right to turn inward and establish a relationship with the unconscious. In this way, the anima may become conscious as an inner factor. In his children's dream seminar, Jung describes what happens in the process of integrating the anima. Quote, the result of the animas becoming conscious is that distinctions are, uh, are being made. The paradoxical and, as it were, completely amoral anima has to be split because otherwise it would remain inexplicable and not comprehensible for consciousness. Then it occurs that the man experiences the white and the black anima, the saint and the witch or the evil Circe. The anima is an absolutely paradoxical being, which however, is basically always one and the same. It is precisely her ambiguous nature that fascinates man, attracts him until he perishes and that he has to escape." Unquote. The splitting of the anima occurs unconsciously in Moss 
it simply happens, triggered by the woman's repulsion as she abandons and leaves him. The rupture in their relationship, as the narrative suggests, results primarily from the problematic relationship Mars maintains with his daughter. The crucial clue here is provided by the arrangement of two photographs of children that Mars has arranged in his little hideaway, a shelter within his apartment he refers to as his Ark of Bullrushes. In German, Binsenkästchen, the Ark of Bullrushes, the Ark or vessel in which the baby Moses is abandoned on the Nile. This is in Exodus 2, 3. Moss has arranged these photos in his Ark of Bullrushes, so they hang opposite each other as if they were engaged in a dialogue with one another. One shows Amy, the other Moss himself, both at the age of three. Amy is holding up to the camera a drawing she dedicated to her father, a blue winged horse, a Pegasus. Moss's picture on the other side of the bedside table is captioned Miracle Boy. The old newspaper clipping shows a boy with a thickly bandaged head. This image documents an early trauma in Moss's life, an attempted murder, possibly committed by his own mother, who he, he believes threw her son out of a window in a fit of rage. Moss barely survived that initial assault. Although his personal mother resembled a cold, uncaring stepmother, in German we say a raven mother to an Rabenmutter to him, although she resembled this cold, uncaring stepmother, Moss is too attached to the mother image. As a father, he tries to make up for the negativity of his mothering experience by being the good mother to his own child or by making the daughter his mother. The most violent anima obsession can develop from such a constellation as Jung explains. This is again a quote from the children's dream seminar, quote, the more somebody clings to the mother, the more dependent he is on the processes going on in his unconscious, the stronger their archetypal power and their demonic power will become, unquote. This fate of a pronounced mother complex is alluded to by the Pegasus, which the daughter holds up to the father as if it were a sign. The Pegasus, a hybrid of bird and horse, is a child of the Gorgon Medusa and an emblem of the creative or generating power where its hoof stands, a spring gushes forth. The winged horse has been the symbol of poets since the Renaissance. Another episode of the Pegasus myth relevant for our context tells of the ancient hero Bellerophon, 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 who succeeded in taming the wild Pegasus, so that with its help, he could defeat the Chimera, a mother dragon with three heads. Because Moss develops a mad monkey love for Amy and oversteps the boundaries of his care, 
Stella tries to destroy their relationship. The extent to which Mars idealizes and appropriates his daughter can further be seen in the fact that even as an older man, he constantly lives with expectation of her arrival, in a sense, fantasizing her into his presence. One could say that one could say Mas's anima image here is too high and too pure. It does not want to mix with the dark side of the woman. Here is also the deeper reason why Stella was cruel to him and pursued separation. Before the judge, before the court, she presents his monkey love as pedophilia, one of the sharpest weapons to deprive him of custody. It's as if she were telling him, you are completely identified with your daughter. This has to end. The divorce seems negative but it actually means something positive. Only through the external separation does Moss have a chance to get away from his anima obsession. If it had not happened this way, in this way, he wouldn't have developed his personality nor his creative potential. Jung has described the necessity of dissolving the man's anima projection. Quote from the children's seminars, dream seminars. The first anima experience of the boy is a very high idea, something incomprehensibly grand and beautiful. It is so beautiful that he just knows that he can only lose it. It is like the farewell to paradise, that wonderful thing, just beginning, filled with pain, it's lost. This is connected with those golden memories, those prenatal images, which are still sensed by the child. The boy's separation pain shows that he is attached to those magical images, that he comes from that world, which, however, he has to leave behind. He has to choose the dirty path, just as eating dust comes after the loss of paradise. It is outright dangerous to, to remain attached to this lost world, because in that case, one refuses to get in touch with the earth. And that means one will never quite be born into life." Unquote. Stella, which means Latin star, Stella then would literally become a faded star guiding Moss's life for good or ill. This path of conflict proceeds in stages. It begins with the splitting of the anima image. Stella is the witch who takes what is dearest to him. Amy, on the other hand, is Moss's greatest treasure. Moss is thereby suspended between the light anima aspect in the daughter and the dark anima aspect in the woman, the wife. For a man suffering from a mother complex, it is a great challenge to accept the abysmal, ugly, or even treacherous female as he experiences her embodiment in the unfaithful retaliation-seeking woman that Stella is. Such a man fears the dark side of the feminine. It could devour him 
and attempts to suppress it. Because Stella now robs him of the highest value in life, a deadly blow to him, Moss is thrown into grim conflict. No doubt, because the earlier trauma of the negative mother is touched upon once more, he forgets himself. Diabolical passions seize him. Anger, hatred, and possessiveness lead him to get involved with a sinister force like the Mafia to get his child back. To commission his own wife, that is to allow for someone, some dark figure, to put a murder contract out on Stella, seems to Mars the only conceivable solution to his problem. This is only possible because he is completely disconnected from feeling. Once again, and I'm coming to the end of my first part of the presentation, once again, a brief summary. The initial situation of the story shows a split between the female and the male principle. They are out of relation. The woman becomes unfaithful and wants a divorce. The man makes his demands and pursues the woman relentlessly. This personal problem corresponds to a collective state of consciousness in which the male principle, spirit, exhausts itself in conflict situations, while the female principle of errors, the culture of feeling and mediation, has degenerated and is only interested in matters of prestige and power. Amy, the daughter, symbolizes a possibility for renewal of the feminine energy that would have to assert itself in the face of these difficulties. However, the feminine remains absent in this narrative in Solar Eclipse. Later on, June, the woman in the Sea of Stars in the fourth uh, narrative takes her place. Okay, that's uh, the first part of my presentation. So, welcome back to the second part of my presentation. I entitled this next chapter Cognitio. Day, and that means the seeing of God, um, the realizing of God, and with that I allude allude to uh, Moses' encounter with God, um, and around this scene uh, revolves uh, my fourth part and I come here to the crucial question of why Moss had abandoned his plan to commission Stella. To give up this plan had enormous consequences for his life as you will see. When Moss is torn between Stella and Amy, and that is between the dark aspect of the anima and the light aspect of the anima. At the climax of this acute conflict, there occurs the unheard of event, something that figuratively crosses his life's path and thwarts the hero ruining his best laid plans. Remember, Moss describes with 
painstaking accuracy how he arranges to have Stella eliminated by a contract killing. And he is retelling this, um, I don't know, I think it goes over three pages, three or four pages long. In this context of telling this, how he would like to have her commissioned, he mentions a ghastly dream that came to him the night before the money was to be handed over. In this dream, he found himself in the basement of a mobster. The dreamer was required to cut his finger and let the blood drip down the mobster's throat. Consequently, Moss would be in league with organized crime. He is about to come to become one of them, a mobster too. The dream depicts the activation of destructive forces in the unconscious embodied in the mobster and confronts the dreamer with the evil in his own psyche. Faust and his alliance with the devil, with Mephistopheles, comes naturally to mind here. The warning dream can be interpreted as foreshadowing the appearance of the dark god the following day. Moss provides the context for that all-changing break, which is to occur the moment he will actually hand over the money, thus giving the okay for the killer to carry out the job. So Moss gives the context. Uh, this is a quote from the book, Moss speaking, quote, I pass a bank and see my reflection in the plate glass window. Rushing toward my destination, my hand in my pants pockets, Sinatra style. And I realized completely insane. The large class pane provided just enough of a reflection. The light was right for me to catch a glimpse of myself. And I stopped, stopped dead, looked at myself in that sea of glass, saw my eyes, the eyes of a stranger looking back at me. I was so unrecognizable that it horrified me. I turned away just a half turn to the door, took one step, then another, went into the bank, made my way to the teller and deposited the money." Unquote. In this moment of reflection, that is in this moment of his image being reflected by the mirroring glass of the bank building surface, Mars shockingly recognizes the presence of the strange dark God within himself. Those are his own eyes from which the demon looks at him. The biblical image of the, quote, sea of class, uh, an image from Revelations 4 to 6, the biblical image of the sea of class of the bank building's outer surface creates a connection to the god of the apocalypse, who, according to legend, reflected his face in the ocean of heaven, heaven that surrounded his throne, the sea of class. 
This epiphany is so overwhelming and terrifying that Mars instinctively revises his plan without thinking. We know that mirrors, mirroring surfaces, have served as means of self-knowledge since time immemorial. In early cultures, they were the smooth surface of a body of water. Mirrors and windows represent thresholds into the unconscious, making the unseen visible. The uncanny face in the mirror represents the primordial, undifferentiated dark aspect of, of the psyche that has been teased out by Moss's murderous behavior. And as it happens, yes, Moss is at odd with himself because of the deep conflict with Stella. He acts contrary to instinct and is obsessed with power. He wants to have his child back. So, and he does everything to get this. The, murder, the murderousness that has befallen him is in a sense reflected back at him. And that means he has to see and accept the killer, this killer shadow within himself. If Mars were to give in to the constellated instinct for revengeful destruction, he would be completely assimilated or swallowed, swept away by overpowering violence. He would be a mere tool of Satan. An archetype of such an encounter with the dark other is found in the New Testament. I mean, the temptation of Jesus by a, by a power devil in Matthew 4, 1 to 11. Jesus stays in the desert for 40 days. In this phase of introversion, he becomes certain that his kingdom is not of this world. Moss too does not allow himself to be used by the tempter and makes an ethical decision that includes a felt knowledge of the right way. In the immediate confrontation with the antagonist, with the devil, Jesus recognized that time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is present. He speaks to the people, return and repent, and your sins are forgiven. Because Jesus has recognized the way he sees the inner kingdom already given as reality. Because Jesus has experienced it and now acts accordingly. He heals the sick and proclaims the gospel. Moss also chooses the inner way. He lives alone for 40 years from now on and writes an extensive manuscript that will be lost to him many years later. This writing is something like his personal confession of sins, insofar as he confesses the conspiracy within the, with the mafia therein. In his conversation with the narrator, Moss picks up where he left off, bringing his diabolical drive and lust for power to life once again. And this is, I think, this is typical shadow work, the work on his shadow, although maybe not consciously. It is 
this shadow work is a condition for the recovery of the anima. But again, back to that luminous moment of God's appearance in the bank's mirroring outer class surface. Psychologically, the ego stopping that moment of standing still means Mars is ready to accept the dark God who assaults him through the mirror. It is an involuntary pausing and, realis and realization of God's darkly luminous presence, a moment of supreme danger. Mars consciously renounces and moves away from the grand plan, a step which results in enormous consequences for his life. Such a radical turn of events is synonymous with a metanoia. Metanoia, you know this Greek word. I mean with this a complete reversal in the sense of reorientation and new direction. But how would this reversal, which turns the persecutor that Mars is into the persecuted, how would this reversal be understood as an inner process? At first, the ego takes a masculine attitude toward the conflict with Stella, with the anima. Mars allows himself to be driven by instinct for aggression and power. He asserts his claim on the daughter and any means will do, even if it be the murder of his own wife. This is the phallic nature, penetrative thrust, directed energy. Then, triggered by the vision, an enantiodromia, enantiodromia is a word um, Jung uses a lot uh, in his answer to Job, for example, and it means a sudden switch to the opposite. And this has happened here um, in this vision. Uh, there occurs an, a sudden switch to the opposite. Now, after the first phase of the masculine attitude, Mars took against, uh, towards the conflict, now triggered through the vision, now occurs uh, the second phase, a female, female understanding prevails, mass becoming, you could say, a receiving vessel. He pauses, reflects, and understands what his eyes have received, what has penetrated him to the core. He accepts this content and makes the spontaneous ethical decision to step back, to withdraw. But what did he realize in that moment of revelation, of seeing this dark face in the mirror, which is his own, his own dark eyes and his own um, drive to kill. What did he realize in that moment of revelation? Mars himself uses the image of the, quote, vessel of anger, which that demonic being in the mirror had been ready to pour out on him. The biblical cup of wrath Again, a quote from Revelations, it's Revelation 16, 1 to 21. The biblical cup of wrath 
symbolizes the onslaught of archetypal destructive energies lurking behind the dark eyes in the mirror. When these elemental forces are released, they bring sevenfold calamity upon the earth. I think I repeat that sentence, it's so important. The biblical cup of wrath symbolizes the onslaught of archetypal destructive energies lurking behind the dark eyes in the mirror. When these elemental forces are released, they bring, quote, sevenfold calamity upon the earth. This is Revelation 15, 7. Sevenfold calamity. The archetypal image of the cup of wrath makes visible the larger collective canvas behind the individual experience of moss. For example, in, we have uh, such an archetypal image of the dark God in Jeremiah, where it says, quote from Jeremiah, Yahweh, the God of Israel said this to me, Take this cup of wine from my hand to make all the nations to whom I sent you drink it. Let them drink and reel, lose their wits at the sword I am sending among them. I took the cup from the hand of Yahweh and made all the nations to whom Yahweh sent me drink it. This is Jeremiah 25, 15 to 80. Edinger interprets this passage thus, quote, we must realize that affects and concupiscence derive from Yahweh because it's the effect of his divine wrath that is being poured out. Effects and concupiscence are the manifestations of the primitive, unregenerate self. So that to assimilate those effects and to subjugate that concupiscence means, in essence, to drink the contents of the cup of divine wrath rather than pour it out. And to do so, and to do that brings about a transformation or humanization of the self. Unquote. This divine power, the affect power that comes from the self, approaches Moss, and it wants to realize itself through him, through Moss, to use him as an implementing organ. He would be, metaphorically speaking, the filled cup of wrath that is about to be poured out. Now, Yahweh paradoxically lets the cup of wrath be poured out over Babylon after he had used Babylon shortly before as a punishing tool against his people. And this very scenario also threatens Moss. After God would have used Moss to destroy Stella, he would pour out the cup of wrath on him, on Moss. We learn, after all, that Moss, like the other mobsters, would have died in a bloodbath had he arrived on time at the agreed meeting place. And so the appearance in the mirror was also a fateful life-saving event, as Moss explains to the narrator. Moss speaking, quote, if the light, 
if the light striking the bank's window, if that cloud in the sky had passed over the sun, just imagine what a crazy thought. If the wind driving the cloud had been a bit stronger and the sun had been hidden a moment sooner, I wouldn't have stopped, wouldn't have seen anything in the window, or at least not enough to stop me in my tracks." Unquote. Moss, at any rate, immediately recognizes that the onslaught of instinct is meant for him, since he has betrayed his beloved. Out of vindictiveness and greed, he wants Stella killed in order to gain possession of the child. Is this wrathful face now to be understood as a threat of punishment? Or is it the dark God in his primitive aspect who does not at all want to act morally and punish, but who simply recognizes a vessel into which he can pour out his cup of wrath? Or is it both a moral God and at the same time, an undifferentiated demonic God? Despite all ambivalence, it is also clear that Mars is meant to see the face. He recognizes this after he has distanced himself returns again to the spot where he had stood still, mirrored, and now finds everything changed. Mars speaking, quote, the sun was at a different angle now, or maybe a cloud was blocking it. At any rate, nothing caught my attention this time. I had glanced at the bank window because I, because I wanted to see again what I had recognized. But as I said, the window was no longer reflecting. The light had changed." Unquote. It was ultimately the sun that was positioned so favorably that it allowed him for a moment to see the outrageous danger he was in. Moss understood this twist of fate as a hint. Had he continued on his way, he would have perished in the hail of bullets in the diner along with the others. The fact that Moss resists the diabolical temptation to be seduced into power is a moral achievement that is anything but self-evident. Because he does not identify himself and decides of his own free will against the offer, he makes himself the vessel of the dark god who wants to change. He, Moss, is an example for an earthly tabernacle. Earthly tabernacle, as Jung once pointed out in a letter to Robert Corti. Moss himself describes his refusal of the dark aspect of God as a pact with God, insofar as he, Moss, was spared from ruin at the price of the daughter. Again, Moss speaking, quote, I was making this sacrifice because, well, in the last analysis of my own free will, I had seen something, crazy that reflection, put there to let him, God, see the truth. He was the crazy one. I think he, God, saw himself in me. 
at this moment, saw himself in my plans and was prepared to empty out his vessel of anger." Unquote. Marie-Louise von Franz pointed out on several occasions that we cannot integrate such powerful effects as anger, hatred, or envy into our ordinary ego. Quote, von Franz, all that hopeful, well-meaning prattle we hear about integrating one's own aggression is nonsense. Only through effort and suffering can we lend support to the integration of these powers into the self. In other words, we can only integrate our personal shadow, not the collective shadow of the self, the dark side of the Godhead." Unquote. Moss is required to make a nearly an inhuman sacrifice in this regard. He is required to make a nearly inhuman sacrifice. Not only must he give up his ideas of a happy family life, he must forgo one of the deepest human instincts, the paternal feeling toward his own child. Psychologically, the sacrifice of his daughter signifies an overcoming of the unconscious insofar as the forced detachment from her, from the daughter, is a condition of the possibility of redeeming the anima. I think I should repeat this because it's important and complicated. Psychologically, the sacrifice of his daughter signifies an overcoming of the unconscious in so far as the forced detachment from her, from Amy, is a condition of the possibility of redeeming the anima. Parallel to this, the still sun-like attitude with its Sun, I mean S O N. So, as a re, um, parallel to this, the still sun like attitude with its unconscious attachment to the mother is abandoned. As a result of his renunciation, Moss enters into a gruesome process of both being split and paralyzed at the same time. This condition of being split and paralyzed extends over many years and wears him down. He is without anima, without life energy. Yet after 40 years of this wandering in the desert, the path of suffering culminates in that final moment of fulfillment, which the text captures in the enigmatic phrase, quote, and Mars glowed in the light of his visitation, unquote. This is the last sentence of the story, as you may remember. Moss glowed in the light of his visitation. Moss, when he has finished telling his story, has arrived at himself. He is one with himself and in touch with his soul center. He had a uh, quote, this is a narrator, he had, Moss had collected his life around him and said, you are both here, nothing is missing, unquote. 
Stella and Amy are gathered again and stand before him, before Moss, recollected. The outward sign of this rediscovered wholeness is the fire that lights Moss up inside and makes his face shine like the face of Moses after his coming down from the mountain, from Mount Sinai, after the encounter with God and the revelation of the law. This is Exodus 34, 29. It is the fire of life that is rekindled with all its warmth and vitality and at the same time with its numinous glow. At the, end of his, at the end of his journey, Moss is reconnected to the anima, to Eros, as the threat of feeling. So how can we understand the archetypal background of this story set entirely in contemporary Californian everyday life. We have already encountered some mythical figures like Cory, Persephone in the prodigal daughter and Pegasus as the offspring and overcomer of the negative mother at the beginning of the narrative or the desert experience of Jesus and his temptation by Satan. There is another mythic subtext that runs throughout the solar eclipse story. And this is the Exodus narrative of the Old Testament. You may have realized this already. In this context, the protagonist, Moss McLeod, functions as a, you can say, modern version of the biblical Moses figure. Like the legendary hero who led his people out of Egyptian slavery into the promised land, Moss is charged with leading the enslaved anima out of the unconscious. In other words, the liberator qualities of the archetypal Moses figure are also inherent in Moss, as his very name, a shortened form of Moses, signals. The original Moses ability, that divine liberator and redeemer power, is rudimentarily present in Moss and can be activated accordingly. Patrick Roth's Moss, however, is not an archetype in the sense of a classical hero. Rather, the archetype is represented in Moss. In him, there is an oppression or enslavement at work, a subjugation of the soul herself. As with so many men and women in our time, the feminine principle is in captivity. And like the people of Israel, it must be freed so psychic balance can be restored. In other words, the conscious mind must connect with the unconscious in order for man to recover and be restored to health. Like the legendary predecessor, Moss also embarks on a 40 year wandering through the desert, the wilderness before reaching the Holy Land at the end of the journey. As Moses follows God in the desert, that is 
as he follows the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, so too Ma seeks to follow his personal star of destiny. Moss is a modern son of a cloud, a mech cloud, and he is as such a God seeker who, as we have seen, allows himself to be seized by the numinosum and is able to acknowledge even a negative persecuting aspect of God. This applies equally to Moses and Moss. The way is the goal because it is not granted to them to arrive concretely in the promised land. Moses dies shortly before the Israelites enter Canaan and Moss is not reunited with his wife and daughter at the end of the story. The redemption of their longing eludes them, eludes both Moss and Moses. And yet a transformation has taken place along the way. The people of Israel who enter the Holy Land are no longer the people who once went out of Egypt. And Moss too is no longer who he was before telling his story. He has rediscovered his emotional life and experiences the anima as an inner vision of the feminine that makes him the deprived, divided one whole again and infuses him with life. And yet the ending of the story is enigmatic and is also contradictor contradictory. Couldn't the mysterious glow, that allusion to Moses' shining face after receiving the law also indicate an inflation? Might not Moss in the end be identified with the self, with God? And isn't there something psychotic about his attitude, his last words to Amy, addressed to the narrator, as if this, his listener, were Amy herself? Certainly, Moss has recreated his loves. They are undoubtedly an inner reality to him. But they are imaginings without counterpart in the external world, in which, after all, Moss still lives as a flesh and blood human being. This problem of a one-sided spiritualization is also found in some fairy tales as Marie-Louise von Franz has shown us. The transformation does not come to earth, not down to the experiential world. It remains in the spiritual, uh, spiritual sphere. Because the experience remains in the imagination, but nothing has changed in practical everyday life, the danger of a relapse and a new fall is great. As soon as Moss becomes completely sane again, he will realize he is alone. And yet, if we look back at the beginning of the story, it is evident he has created something lasting. He now knows that he has loved. And in doing so, he has known, has recognized the anima. So 
how would Moss's experience be evaluated in terms of his individuation? And here is my answer, the attempt of an answer. One might say for a man like Moss, who is suffering from a negative mother complex, it is crucial that he learns to separate, to differentiate himself. Since such a man is obsessed with the anima, life at a certain point tragically intervenes and creates facts that force a detachment, a separation. For example, suddenly and unexpectedly, the wife runs away. This creates space for a new awareness. Now, being alone, this man has a chance to differentiate and experience the anima as an objective inner reality or inner quality that is autonomous and not simply a part of him. Moss has had to suffer this painful lesson in a 40 year involuntarily individuation, a 40 year involuntary individuation. As we know, the number 40 often indicates the number of transformation as in Jesus' desert experience or in the process of mummification, of eternalizing the body with the Egyptians. But then after these 40 years of wandering in the desert, something unforeseen happens, a turning point occurs. Moss finds a companion who takes part in his fate, who listens to him patiently. And now comes the decisive moment. Through the remembering by telling, life storytelling, and by way of collecting and piece by piece confessing the fragments of the stellar experience, Moss creates for himself a situation that allows him to regain his lost connection to the anima. One may say the first rather unconscious phase of individuation uh, within this, these 40 years is crowned and completed by a new consciousness gained during a second, a more condensed phase via that long conversation with the narrator. The anima which Moss sees mysteriously before him at the very end remains projected to be sure, but something is mysteriously redeemed in the course of his narration. For Moss now realizes that it need not be he who makes connection with the anima, that this might also be done for him by his friend, the narrator. Quote, Moss is speaking. Listen, Amy, Moss was speaking directly to me, the narrator. If anyone tells you this story, maybe it will be my friend here who went looking for my manuscript with me. The manuscript I wrote for you. Moss stared at me, his eyes never wavering from my face. But we didn't find it, Amy, not a trace. This friend of mine will tell you the story when I'm dead and gone. He'll tell you what had happened when I took your mother's hand. And I loved that woman, Amy, I loved her. 
he'll describe it for you, unquote. At the end of the story, the helpful function of the narrator, as therapeutic as it is, as, as it is poetic, the, the helpful function of the narrator once again comes into focus. The narrator is commissioned by Moss to bear witness of his life story and to pass it on to his daughter and to all those who follow. The narrator thus moves into the position of a mediator and a remembrancer who, when Mars will no longer exist, will pass on the life essence of this man. Inasmuch as Moss commissions the narrator to bear witness to his experience with the feminine, he has become aware that his life was not in vain. He knows something will remain and be passed on to the next generation, something that must not be forgotten. This legacy of Moss is reminiscent of the legacy of the biblical Moses, who, before crossing into the promised land, leaves the Israelites the song of Moses. And you find that in Deuteronomy 32, 1 to 49. So again, um, before crossing into the promised land, Moses leaves the Israelites the song of Moses to serve as a future witness to the people before God. Moss, on the other hand, leaves behind the testimony of a man bound in love to the animal. He has learned that in order to find the anima, one must lose it. At the end of his search, at the end of his journey, Moss gives up the concrete connection to the wife and daughter. He puts it in the hands of the narrator. It is as if he were saying, I probably won't see Amy again, but you will. This is the assignment to preserve the connection to the animal and thus to the unconscious. Moss himself certainly does not know what the anima is, but the narrator does, who then follows this story, Solar Eclipse, with two other anima narratives. I'm coming to the end now, uh, just as a note that might be enlightening in this context. Jung once commented on a highly complex, mysterious and deep dream that was dreamt by an ordinary simple man. And Jung wondered to himself, now why would the unconscious send such a dream to a man like this? There is no way he can understand what it means. He won't even listen, he is unable to listen. And then Jung realized, but I was listening. I did indeed hear what the unconscious had to say to him and thus committed to me, to me who was listening. Sometimes the dreams of others who are unable to understand them may very well be meant for us who have eyes to hear Eyes, uh, ears to hear and eyes to see. And likewise, for those of us who are reading and understanding solar eclipse, Mars's mission has already been accomplished. The narrator, or rather the author behind him, has taken this man's life testimony 
and extracted the sacred scripture hidden within it for, poster for posterity and all who know how to read it. So that's it. That's all I have to say. Thank you.